everybody. You are listening to Through Time in Clades. Uh, my name is Albert. And I'm Joan. Right. So uh, this is uh, our first episode uh, recorded this month, that is September. Uh, so we will be talk- talking uh, about some of the interesting news items that we noticed uh, related to natural history um, from the previous month, which was August. Um so, yeah, I guess before we jump into the news items, uh, we do want to thank everyone who has been listening and uh, sharing our videos around. We've already received quite a few uh, views considering um, how recent uh, we are and uh, how long our videos tend to be. So uh, we really appreciate it. Yeah, we're glad everyone's uh, enjoying our content. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, especially, uh, we have already received a few shout outs from some, uh, you know, notable outlets, uh, in the paleo online community, uh, notably, um, in the most recent, uh, Mesozoic Miscellany post on love in the time of chasmosaurs. Uh, the, these are monthly roundup posts, uh, ar- organized, organized by, uh, Dave Orr. Uh, he gave us a shout out, uh, you know, mentioning that our, our show had debuted. So uh, thank you so much. Um, and unfortunately, uh, that was also, uh, it was also announced in that post that um, that would be the last Mesozoic Miscellany post because Dave is having trouble finding time to actually uh, make those roundup posts. So uh, we are really thankful that, you know, he, uh, he managed to squeeze us in into that, that final, final uh, roundup post. Yeah, we're definitely very thankful. Um, and we're thankful for the, those uh, Mesozoic miscellanies as well, because those have been kind of uh, helpful news sources and like, you know, what's going on in the world of paleo. But uh, I totally understand where David's coming from. Yeah. I imagine a lot of work to dig around so much to find noteworthy things to share. Absolutely. But we're glad that you did. Yeah, indeed, indeed. <laughs> and uh, another um, major shout out that at least that we we were aware of. Uh, maybe there are others, but I haven't seen them yet. Uh, another major shout out was um, Ben Chrysler sharing our uh, you know, our channel and the videos we had uploaded at the time um, to the dinosaur mailing list. So uh, yeah, mailing lists are uh, you know not not exactly a recent uh, kind of um, online outlet, but uh, the dinosaur mailing list is is still ongoing and it's still an excellent place to. Um, keep track of, you know, news related to dinosaur paleontology, uh, especially thanks to Ben Chrysler's, uh, you know, constant sharing of new papers and articles and videos uh, that he comes across in, in a very comprehensive manner. Um, and one of our, you know, in one of his posts, uh, our you know, our channel was included as, as part of that, um, that roundup. So thanks a lot. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. And, uh, it's kind of really incredible that the dinosaur mailing list is still here. Um, yeah. mm. I'm trying to think how long it's been around. I mean, the most, the oldest things that I remember, uh, it was uh, Dr. Thomas Holtz's comments on the lost world Jurassic Park, mm. <laughs> and the anatomy of the animals. And that was what, the late nineties. Yeah. The, I think the oldest posts set up in archived go all the way back to like 1994 or something like that. Wow. Yeah. It's been around for a long time. Um, it uh, it hasn't always been, or uh, rather, it, it isn't as active as it used to be anymore for various reasons. But uh, nonetheless, uh, it is. It still gets posts pretty much daily. Uh, so, you know, yeah, definitely, uh, definitely quite astonishing that it's held on for this long. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, let's see. Is there anything else that we've been up to that, uh, you'd like to share or we'd like to share? Um, well, speaking of love in the time of the chasmosaurs, uh, I had the fortunate opportunity to write a guest post for the blog. Mm-hmm. Um, every so often they do uh, vintage dinosaur art where they look at old books, not necessarily, um, like for children, but generally in the ballpark of like, you know, popular children's books Mm -hmm. that have come out in the 90s, 80s, 70s, 60s, and onward. And uh, 
earlier this year, uh, pre-pandemic, uh, I was scratching my head because for several years I was looking for a, a book from my youth that I used to love very much. And uh, I had given it away uh, without really thinking too much about it. And so I was like, well, I gotta, I want to try to find a copy again. And uh, it had no online presence whatsoever. <laughs> so it was just, it was the most difficult time trying to find it. And eventually, you know, I, I dug around deeper and deeper and it came to me. Uh, it's a book from 1974, then and now, uh, authored um, by staff from the American Museum of Natural History. And it's sort of a, a, a comparison book. Mm. They look at different groups of animals and they compare the living species with uh, their relatives and descendants in the geologic past. And it includes all sorts of familiar animals like dogs and cats and horses, as well as uh, more uh, wild or exotic forms like you know, giraffes and horseshoe crabs. And it was, I always thought it was a very interesting book in that aspect because I, uh, I was so used to books on prehistoric animals not really touching the living species too much in mm -hmm. that particular way like there would be mentions like oh this belongs to the lineage of giraffes and then that would usually be the end of it right. but this was one that kind of gave equal coverage to both the living and extinct forms and i always admired that so being able to own the book again um i was clued in from david Orr, like if i wanted to write a guest post for the blog because the book had sort of jogged some people's memories that they they kind of remembered it and for mm -hmm. others it was totally new and so I, I jumped at the opportunity and so that premiered um earlier this week and yeah. uh, it's been getting some nice coverage and so i'm very grateful for that excellent yeah pleased to if you guys are into vintage dinosaur art or you know old natural history books do check it out it's a it's a very fascinating book and uh, you did a great job of you know covering it for the blog Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. I guess I haven't been up to uh, too much that is, uh, you know, worth mentioning uh, on the on the show. Uh, still plugging away at my research, which is, you know, grad student life. Um, I did a uh, I did get some uh, reviews back from a paper I had submitted uh, more than a month ago, I think, um, which was nice. And the comments were mostly quite positive. And basically, I only need to make a few minor revisions and send the paper back to the, the journal. And uh, we'll see how it goes from there. So, uh, yeah, that's always convenient. <laughs> yeah, so uh, um, I'm working on those revisions and uh, I'm pretty, pretty pleased about the you know, rather positive reception it had with the, with the reviewers. And they left some very useful uh, suggestions as well. So, yeah, I, I guess I, I won't talk much about what the paper is actually about until it comes out, hopefully. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that, that's kind of the main, main thing I've been dealing with lately. I guess if we don't have anything else to mention, uh, we can jump into the news stories. How does that sound? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So let's see. Okay, I guess we're, we're alternating. So uh, this, I guess this, this, the, this month I, I go first. Um, yeah, so as usual, or at least as as with last month, uh, we have each picked two papers related to natural history that we thought were pretty interesting. Um, and so we're going to talk about it. Um, so the first uh, study that I picked out uh, is related to animal behavior and uh, where they were looking at living animals. In this case, a species of water beetle called Regimbartia attenuata. And um, I, I looked around and I couldn't find too much information about this species. And I, I know it's an aquatic beetle, it's a diving beetle, so it spends a lot of its life living in the water. And it, it apparently can be found in the wild in Japan and I'm not sure, maybe, maybe other parts of Asia as well. Like I, I couldn't actually find any records of it on uh, iNaturalist, for example, which is surprising. But um, yeah, it's about a type of diving beetle. And so the author of this paper, there's only one author, um, decided to see what would happen if this kind of beetle got eaten by a frog. <laughs> <laughs> That's always a fun topic of sex. Right. 
<laughs> yeah, you know, you, you have to wonder, like, what <laughs> what motivates people to... I mean, I, mean I, I can understand the motivation, but it's just like, you know, it's a... <laughs> not, not necessarily what you expect of, you know, um, rigorous scientific research. It's like, I'm going to feed this animal to this other animal. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like the academic equivalent of, like, kids in their backyard. They, they throw a lizard or a... Uh, a scorpion in a, in a cage and see what happens <laughs> right right <laughs> so from from what um i actually found some news articles where they had interviews with this author and uh, apparently he he has studied um uh you know the defensive behaviors of insects and things like that so i, I guess i i guess it's um you know this is kind of fits well within the realm of, of that subject but yeah i know like um I've read certain papers from, say, the nine, you know, as recently as the nineteen seventies or so, uh, where it's basically describing animal behavior by putting two animals in a cage and seeing what happens, and you know, they they document a lot of very interesting behaviors about how um, certain animals hunt or uh, how certain animals defend themselves, but it, you, you, it does seem really questionable the ethics of that that kind of experiment. Oh, right. And then that's assuming that animals in a situation like that would behave the same way in the wild. Right, exactly. Yeah. So it kind of, it, it's, uh, you know, it's understandable why people would be interested in it. And I'm, I'm sure it does give us some interesting information. Um, but yeah, uh, it is questionable on several, several grounds. Um, so mo most of the, those papers that involve vertebrates that I, are the you know 1970s or earlier papers i was alluding to but uh i guess um you know there there aren't really a, a whole lot or even any formal regulations regarding how insects are treated so i guess uh, this kind of uh, experiment is still pretty regularly done on insects and um uh, there doesn't seem to be a big you know um controversy surrounding that no, uh, not judging. Just, uh, <laughs> just uh, highlighting that 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 fact. Um, so, in any case, um, the at least the species, or at least one of the species of frog, and this particular species of beetle used in this experiment, uh, do co-occur in the wild. So it is indeed conceivable that they would uh, naturally meet and interact in some way. And so, in any case, uh, these beetles were fed to frogs of various species and um, what would happen is that the beetles would be you know excreted and they would uh, come out of the back end of the frog in less than six hours after they were eaten and kind of that, that's actually quite an unusual as we will see but also probably the most astonishing thing is that over 90 percent of them were still alive over 90 90 percent of the beetles were still alive and uh they they could survive uh, for you know at least two more weeks afterward if, if not longer and know in one of the interviews I saw the um, the author mention that some of the those same beetles are still alive months after being ingested so it really really wasn't much more than an in inconvenience for for them which is quite astounding <laughs> there uh, there aren't many uh, many animals that are known to survive passage through the digestive system after being eaten by a predator yeah it certainly wouldn't be a fun experience <laughs> no That's not not exactly ever. <laughs> so um, the author tried a few different variations on on this experiment uh, so he also fed some other species of beetles to these frogs and the other species of beetles you know, they they basically all got digested and, and died uh, after being eaten. So it's it's something specific to this particular type of water beetle that allows them to survive. And something else he tried was that uh, he fixed the legs of the beetles of these water beetles um, with wax so that they they couldn't move their their legs around. And what would happen is that if this was done, then the beetles would no longer be able to survive. Um, being inside a frog, um, the beetles were not excreted until more than a day after they got eaten, um, and then they they got digested like you know pretty much any any other prey item. <laughs> um, 
And what this suggests is that libidos are not only, you know, surviving passage through the gut, but they're also actively crawling through the gut or swimming through the gut or somehow propelling themselves through the gut um, and potentially actually stimulating the, the frog to defecate when they reach the end and then they, they get passed out, you know, uh, unharmed. Oh, wow. <laughs> I guess that, that, that's beautifully illustrated by the series <laughs> <Yeah. of images. laughs> Yes, it's a, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he got some uh, ni nice video footage, which is uh, shown in a um, photographic form here. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, that's quite interesting. As you, know, as you might imagine, this hasn't been documented for many other species of animals. Um, the paper cites a few examples where it has been shown in snails, various kinds of snails, when they get that get swallowed by um, fish or birds or whatever. Uh, oh, wow. They some of them are are known to be able to survive passage through the gut, though. Um, as far as I know, I, I don't think they actively crawl out of the, the gut. They just manage to, to survive being inside it. Um, yeah, it, that sounds more more reasonable. Like right. They can just kind of huddle themselves in their shell and just kind of wait it out. Yeah, exactly. Um, so they, they um, or rather the, the paper actually points out the that this kind of beetle does have some adaptations that might help them survive these situations. Um, so, of course, it, it has a very tough exoskeleton, very tough shell. And in addition, uh, because it is an aquatic beetle, it actually carries a little, its little air supply with it. So it carries an air bubble underneath its uh, hard wing coverings while it's swimming underwater. So, you know, the fact that it does this might help it survive in a low oxygen environment, like inside a frog. So I, that does seem quite reasonable. I know um, one example where a vertebrate was documented surviving a passage through another animal's gut, and that was a blind snake. So blind blind snakes are a group of little, little, very small snakes that live in the soil, and they, they kind of look like earthworms if you don't look at them too carefully. Um, and the, as their name suggests, they are blind. So the, this blind snake got swallowed by a toad, um, and the researchers stumbled across it, like crawling out of the toad, un uh, not necessarily unharmed, but still alive, uh, crawling out of the back end of the toad and not, not out through the mouth. But uh, unfortunately, that blind snake only lived for, I think, something like seven hours after it managed to make its great escape. So uh, clearly, it, you know, that could well have been a fluke and uh, you know, not, not something it does all the time but in the case of the water beetles it seems to be an actual like you know defensive adaptation that um has been selected for potentially do you happen to know how long the lifespan of these beetles i have no idea yeah that would be a good question so i'm just i'm thinking about the you know like yeah they're able to get out of the frog right it seems okay but they're like they're still from what it's, it sounds like it seems like they still die prematurely like weeks or months afterwards yeah um, I, i'm not sure i, I think it's uh, I, I think it's just mostly a case of that they haven't been observed for for that long uh, so they, they can survive for at least some weeks or months afterward uh I, I don't think it is known whether or not they actually uh die prematurely because of it okay I see what you're saying, yeah. Right, right. I mean, that, that's still pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're a beetle. <laughs> say, hey, you're not going to believe what I just did. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I guess that's pretty much all I have to say about this study. Uh, you know, the natural world is a constant source of amazement and, uh, you know, <laughs> potentially disgust. <laughs> and amusement, certainly. <laughs> right. So do we want to go to the next story? Certainly. All right. Uh, this one in particular dives uh, back into paleontology. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a study by Martin Kundrat and colleagues. So the titanosaurs were a lineage of long-necked sauropod dinosaurs 
Uh, in fact, these were the only sauropods that managed to survive all the way to the end of the Cretaceous period, so that they witnessed the mass extinction event. Now, uh, they appear to have been a very diverse group of dinosaurs, uh, including forms which may have been the largest land animals that ever walked the Earth. Uh, now, uh, unfortunately, they're also a very poorly known group of dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. uh, the vast majority of species that we know about are from incomplete material of varying degrees of poorness. And uh, if you think the adults are difficult to understand, then I bet you'd imagine the young are even more mysterious. But uh, that doesn't appear to be the case any longer. So uh, uncovered from the Oca Majuevo Lagerstaten in Argentina, uh, around 80 million years ago or so, so this would be a late Cretaceous, uh, they found several eggs from a titanosaur that contained embryos. Now, uh, the story behind the discovery is actually pretty fascinating mm -hmm. in and of itself. Uh, basically, these eggs were removed from Argentina by an illegal collector, certainly the one of the banes of paleontological research, and ended up in the hands of one of the study's members, uh, Terry Manning. Uh, and when its origins were explained and elaborated, they decided to do the responsible thing. Uh, they prepared the eggs and they revealed these you know, intact embryos and they 3D scanned them, but then they repatriated them back to Argentina. Mm -hmm. So now they're stored at the Museo Municipal for further study. So justice worked out there. Uh, now these fossils will hold a valuable place in the history of dinosaur paleontology. Uh, the authors were able to clarify that these were the only embryonic remains that could be definitively assigned to a sauropod dinosaur. So we actually know this is a, a baby sauropod. And not only that, the uh, the skull of this embryo, and in fact, this is the only remains from this particular egg, that there's no postcranial material. Uh, it's the first of its kind that has retained such a preservation that they can reconstruct it in the third dimension. So you can get a appropriate proportions for how a baby sauropod head was supposed to look like. Uh, basically, yeah, this is the, the best embryo of a sauropod that we've ever known so mm -hmm. far. And so uh, the details themselves are incredibly stunning, if you can see from this image here. Uh, almost everything in the skull is intact, even parts of the brain case, and hence the uh, ability to be able to reconstruct it so neatly. Now, by comparing the features of the bones to the development of baby alligators, so a, a close archosaurian relative, uh, the authors suggest that the titanosaur had already gone through about four-fifths of its growth inside the egg mm. before hatching, uh, although there's still no idea how long the incubation period of a titanosaur was. So uh, it's an open question what that exactly means. Now, as far as the uh, phylogenetic affinities, um, of course, we they definitely know it was a titanosaur. Like, there are certain features of the skull that place it confidently in that group compared to, say, uh, diplodocoids or so forth. Uh, but again, it, it's hard to say what kind of titanosaur it was. Um, for the adults of this group, uh, there's not a lot of good skull material. And what is there is not very good at all. So like these sort of full comparisons of features to features, you know, can't be properly done. And so that with the studies uh, examination of this material, the best thing that they could do with the material that they had was that they found the closest affinity for the uh, titanosaur embryos uh, species was an early Cretaceous animal from Brazil called Tapuiasaurus. Mm, yeah. Now, uh, I went and dug up some information about this animal. Uh, <laughs> and from the looks of it, it's a controversy as to where this animal actually belongs in titanosaur phylogeny. <laughs> oh, and that, I think that's true for pretty much any titanosaur. <laughs> right. So <laughs> it's like, yeah, this animal seems to be a close relative of Tapuiasaurus, but that's really as far as they can take it. <laughs> what that means, it, it's up to anybody's guess. Uh, we, we just, we need more and better material. Absolutely. And so this is certainly a, a good head start. Um, but, you know, that's just background information. What's really interesting about this study was that some of the cranial features certainly surprised the authors when they revealed them. Uh, this titanosaur embryo displays stereoscopic 
almost binocular vision Mm -hmm. of a type that's similar to, well, tyrannosaurs or uh, primates, for example, like Mm us, we have stereoscopic vision. Now, generally in nature, uh, many of the herbivorous animals have eyes on the sides of their heads. You know, so that way they can kind of see all around them for dangers while they're grazing, while they're uh, gr- gr- uh, browsing or grazing or whatever. Whereas the predatory animals, well, they need to be able to hone in on prey. So their eyes generally face forwards. So, you know, why would a baby herbivorous dinosaur such as this need stereoscopic vision in the first place? Well, the authors went ahead and suggested that this might actually have been helpful in predator detection. So while the young were eating, if they held their head in certain positions, they'd be able to get a wide range in front of them and they could make out whether a dinosaur or a crocodilian or whatever was stalking them. Hmm. Uh, That's really all they had to say about it. They didn't dive too deep into that. But uh, the other big key find that they found in this uh, skull was the presence of what appears to be a, a nasal horn on the snout. Now, if you know anything about uh, reptiles and birds, you might think that this is the egg tooth. Hmm. So when a a bird or an alligator or so forth uh, is about to hatch, it has this little little tooth that it uses to kind of make punctures into the egg and help it uh, crack the eggshell easier and get out without all the struggle because the eggshells tend to be pretty tough for some of these animals. But uh, the position on this embryo here uh, of this nasal horn, uh, it's not where the egg tooth is usually found in baby birds and crocodilians and so forth. Um, it's a lot higher up on the skull. And based upon how the embryo may have held itself in the egg, it doesn't really seem effective for cracking eggshells than, say, the more dorsal position of the typical egg teeth. And so, yeah, it, it's really more of a horn than an egg tooth. And uh, in fact, the authors refer to the face thusly as a monocerotic face. Mm. I have a specific term for that, one horn. Now, uh, this is not a feature that is found in any adult Tyrannosaurus skull material that we currently have. And uh, so the authors, you know, they don't rule out 100% that this is you know, an egg tooth and not a nasal horn. Mm. They, they leave that opening. Yeah. But they do suggest that, you know, this maybe this is a, a temporary developmental feature, you know, that was used in a different way mm. during the, the early lifespan of these babies. Uh, digging around some of the journal articles that were announcing this paper, um, they give some speculation that, well, it's a nasal horn, so it must have been a defensive thing, mm. right? Mm. You know, no different than how maybe a ceratopsian might use its horns to defend itself. Um, so again, this is this would be another adaptation to uh, predation pressures, if you will. Now, <laughs> that being said, I couldn't find that specific suggestion anywhere in the original study. Oh. So uh, <laughs> I'm not exactly sure where that came from. Um, maybe it was on the part of the journalists, or maybe there was an interview with one of the author papers. I, I couldn't really figure that out too well. But uh, in short, you know, what we're dealing with here is one of the best juvenile sauropod skull material ever known. Uh, not only that, one of the best sauropod skull material that we have. And uh, you know, only time will tell if that record becomes broken. Who knows, maybe it already has. Just got to wait for the announcement. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I uh, uncovered about this. And uh, it's just incredibly fascinating to me. Um, it is a fantastic specimen. Yeah, um, definitely the the nasal horn is quite curious. I, I yeah, I, I did wonder if it was, you know, a egg tooth or a, an analogous structure, which I, I guess is still, still possible. I know one interesting thing about the egg teeth in living reptiles is that in squamates and lizards, the, the egg tooth is an actual tooth that, you know, pops, projects from the mouth, um, and is used to break open the egg. But in, um, in birds and crocodilians, I think it is more of a keratinous structure, so it's not a true tooth. Um, so, yeah, maybe this was this was their version of it, but uh, I, I do know they speculate that it, it might have served other functions as well, like or was retained long after hatching, which would 
be quite different from a from a typical egg tooth. Oh yeah, and again, there there is the assumption about the position of the embryo in the egg. Right, right. I mean, if, if we're going by um, phylogenetic comparisons, you know, where the baby is sort of tucked in in its belly, mm -hmm. the head kind of being held down towards the, the backside of the animal. Right. Like then, I can see how it would be difficult to be used as an egg tooth mm -hmm. because the head would essentially have to kind of turn itself mm -hmm. in a way to crack the egg. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But uh. Yeah, well, maybe maybe sauropods were doing something different with their embryos, but uh, I guess that remains to be seen. Right, right. Yeah, so I, I do know there there have been there have actually been um, previous um, embryonic titanosaurs found in um, other parts of Argentina, although they're they're not they're not as well preserved as this one. So this is definitely the best to look at a skull. Um, so I think. Um, Alca Mojuevo is actually the, the site of the, the earlier um, findings. And this one was um, originally, um, let's see, I think originally uh, being sold on the fossil market and then before being repatriated. So it is, uh, I think the provenance is not entirely clear, although the dealer, according, and I just pulled up the paper just now, uh, the, yeah. deal, the dealer, um, apparently uh, said that it came from the Allen formation. Yeah, that, that's always frustrating. Um, I know a lot of this material, you know, gets stolen from sites. Yeah. And, you know, usually never sees the light of, of proper scientific analysis. Right. Like it doesn't go into a museum. It, it probably ends up in somebody's mansion as a display right. piece or something or, or is sold somewhere else and is just kind of kept locked away. Um, yeah, it's, it's frustrating because it, it's like, you know, who who knows what sorts of, you know, really helpful specimens are just kind of out there somewhere. Oh, gosh. Yeah, absolutely. So, Not only that, with like no no background information, mm -hmm. the strata and the, the locality and the dates. You know, it, right. As I understand, a lot of those fossils, you know, if they ever are retrieved, you know, they're almost useless. Right. Because you can't really do proper study on them. Mm -hmm. I think some institutions like won't accept them. Yeah. Anyway, if if they're recovered. Right. If, right. If that's correct. Yeah, it's a it's an unfortunate situation. It is a good thing that this one got you know, uh, retrieved and uh, placed into the scientific trust. But uh, yeah, that is a that is a major issue in in paleontology. All righty. Well, I've said everything I need to say. Was All there right. anything you wanted to add? Um, I think that was all mostly what I had to say too. I guess I guess the last kind of minor thing I want to point out is I I like like how they put these cartoony uh, goofy eyes on the <laughs> on the figure. Yeah. I've seen that a couple times right. before. Right. Uh, it's like oh, by the way, the eyes are here. <laughs> right. Just in case you couldn't tell. Right. <laughs> Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, I guess in, in this case, it's kind of uh, emphasizing the stereoscopic binocular vision. Uh, but yes, it, it is quite amusing to see see how it's done like that. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, I guess we can do the next story in that case. Um, so the other story I pick out, so, well, technically, the, this is going to be about two studies, but they're, they're on re related subjects, so I'm going to cover both of them. Um, sure. So there were two studies that came out last month uh, regarding flight potential in Mesozoic Paravian dinosaurs. And, of course, as you might imagine, the origin of avian flight is always a hot subject in dinosaur paleontology. Um, as you know, one of the major aspects of bird evolution that people are most obsessed with trying to figure out. And so... I guess as a as a kind of, as some background, I suppose, uh, the group Paravies uh, is a group that includes modern birds, but also a lot of their very very close relatives of modern birds. So uh, Paravies can be split into kind of three major groups. Um, one of these is Aviali, and Aviali is the one that includes modern birds. Uh, it also includes. A lot of very bird-like forms, like the opposite birds, the Enantiornithians, um, and also 
uh, things like Confucius Ornus or uh, probably Archaeopteryx belong to this group, Aviale. So this is the group that includes modern birds in a lot of the very birdy forms. Another group within Paravis is uh, Dromaeosauridae. Uh, the Dromaeosaurids are the group that includes uh, things like Velociraptor and Deinonychus, Utah Raptor, uh, Raptor dinosaurs, basically. Um, uh, very, very um, well known from uh, from movies, and the the dromaeosaurids um, in general seem to have been more specialized uh, for attacking uh, larger prey items than the other Paravians. So, uh, some of the largest ever Paravians are members of Dromaeosauridae, things like Utah Raptor, which was about the size of a grizzly bear. Although there are plenty of very small dromaeosaurids as well. Um, and then there's another group called Troodontidae, and Troodontids are quite similar to Dromaeosaurids and Aviolans in many ways. Well, they tended to have um, shorter forelimbs, um, and they tend to have very long and slender legs, so they're probably good runners. Um, and many of them appear to have been probably omnivorous, so their their teeth don't seem um, very specialized for attacking very large animals, but um, they could have, you know, been used for catching small prey or in, in some cases maybe even eating plants. So they're potentially omnivores or small prey predators. And they're also well known for having relatively large brains compared to their body size. Now, all, all Paravians have relatively large brains compared to their body size, but um, out of all the non-Aviolan dinosaurs, um, the some of the troodontids appear to have had the, the largest uh, brain to body size ratio so you you'll see in many many uh, old and even not so old um, sources on dinosaurs talking about how troodontids were the smartest dinosaurs things like that now compared to um some of the, the you know more intelligent modern birds today uh, their brain brain sizes were probably not that spectacular but uh, during the Mesozoic, they certainly would have been some of the larger brained animals around, even including Mesozoic mammals. Um, so traditionally, it has been very difficult to figure out um, how these three main lineages of Paravians are related to each other. Um, and, it, and it still is. It still is. It, th this problem hasn't really gone away, I would say. Um, and it's... I would say it, it probably is in some ways especially true now because we, we have a greater understanding of some of the early members of each of these lineages. And it turns out the early members of each of these lineages look pretty much the same. They look very similar to each other, which is what you'd expect. Um, but also it makes things very difficult uh, when trying to figure out phylogenetic relationships because, you know, this certain early member could be a member of one lineage or it could be a member of another lineage or uh, it could be either one or uh, it's it's very difficult to, to find that out because they, they don't really have um, a lot of the specializations of their later, more distinctive uh, relatives. And kind of, you know, related to this is that we, uh, it is not entirely clear which of these three lineages is more closely related to one another. Now, one of the more popular ideas that for you know, the past several couple of decades, I guess, uh, is that the Troodontids and the Dromaeosaurids are each other's closest relatives, and Aviolans are kind of the next group out. Um, so the, the group uniting Troodontids and Dromaeosaurids has generally been called um, Deinonychosauria, Deinonychosaurus. Uh, however, there have been Quite a few recent studies have suggested that instead maybe the troodontids are more closely related to aviolans and the dromaeosaurids are kind of the, the outgroup to those guys so it's still kind of an open question and um there there are some other uh, other arrangements as well but we don't have to go into them they're they're not not as um, widely supported but nonetheless it kind of highlights how tricky it is to figure out the relationships within this group now, in particular, there's a group called the Enchiornithids or Enchiornithines. Um, and this group is mostly known from the late Jurassic of um, China. And they are pretty much the oldest known Paravians, probably. 
uh, and they basically look like what you'd expect a basal Peruvian to look like. They were they were small dinosaurs. A lot of them were you know between the size of a pigeon to a chicken maybe. So they were small. They they could perch on your shoulder. Uh, potentially the smaller ones could perch in your hand. Uh, and they were very heavily feathered because we find we find fossils of them preserved with their feathers and they many of them at least were pretty much entirely covered with feathers like almost the entire face was feathered the the feet were feathered uh, they were very very fluffy and they not only had long feathers on their forelimbs uh, which is typical of Peruvians but also you know somewhat long feathers on their uh, on their hind limbs as well. So they probably looked like they were kind of wearing these bell bottom pants or something in life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, the long hind limb feathers are also a fairly common uh, feature in some of the other early Paravians, as we shall see, but uh, definitely it seems to have been a very widespread uh, feature in the Ankyornithids. And so the Ankyornithids, uh, being some of the earliest known Paravians, are unsurprisingly have kind of jumped around in the family tree plenty of times uh so they have you know been allied with they, they've been considered maybe they were troodontids or maybe they were avialans uh it's uh it's not entirely clear so the first of these uh two studies i'm going to talk about it was uh done by pay et al and published in current biology i i noticed that uh, we have quite a few current biology papers in this episode so the the beetle study I covered earlier was published in Current Biology. So was the Titanosaur paper that we just talked about. And so is this one that I'm talking about right now. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we were looking for, you know, current biology stuff to talk about. So what better place to look? It is quite appropriate. Yeah, yeah. That, that was not intentional, but it does seem like quite a few interesting studies were published in that journal um, the past month now. Plenty of interesting studies are published in that journal all the time, but especially this month, apparently. Um, so, yeah, uh, so they did a number of things, but the, the main thing they actually wanted to figure out was um, how well all these dinosaurs could fly. Um, because, as I mentioned, uh, many of these dinosaurs are small bodied and they, they have these you know, long foreland feathers forming a wing like structure. So it, it is believable that at least some of them had some kind of aerial locomotion capabilities. But something else they did was that they updated a phylogenetic analysis, um, or they, they updated a phylogenetic data set and ran an, an analysis based on that. So this uh, data set they were building on has been worked on for a long time. Uh, I think it, it pretty much originated uh, with um, paleontologists working at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Uh, you know, trying to assemble this giant data set, figuring out relationships of um, birds and bird-like dinosaurs. Um, and this, uh, this data set has, actually has a, a name. It's called the Theropod Working Group Data Set, or TWIG for short. And so this is, I guess, kind of the latest incarnation of it. And so they, they did a number of things. I, I, I'm not going to go into the details because they're pretty arcane, but uh, they basically did a number of uh, updates to their data set and uh, applied some fancy methods to it. And what they found for th this particular iteration is that they found troodontids and dromaeosaurids as each other's closest relatives. Uh, so they're united united in that group, Deinonychosauria, uh, where, whereas the Enchiornithids were found to be uh, an early branch of the avialans. So this is the, the best supported kind of topology of relationships that they discovered. Now, of course, that will still be open to plenty of question uh, in future research or uh, with the in light of new discoveries, but that is uh, at, least a, at least the one they favor for now. Mm -hmm. Now, now that they have a, uh, you know, what seems to be a robust uh, phylogeny, what they wanted to do was uh, figure out uh, the flight capabilities of these dinosaurs, but also kind of map out uh, where flight occurs in this uh, family tree. And so they looked at a huge range of these 
Paravian dinosaurs and even, even some other non-Paravian theropods as well. And they used basically two proxies to estimate uh, how well these extinct animals might have been able to fly. So one of these was wing loading. Now wing loading is basically how much uh, body mass an animal has, so how heavy an animal is compared to the size of its wings. So an animal with very large wings compared to its body size has a relatively low wing loading, and one that has relatively small wings has a high wing loading. Uh, and as you might imagine, it is typically um, easier to get into flight if you have a relatively low wing loading with larger wings compared to your body mass. So they did that. And something else they did was they calculated specific lift. And what this is, is basically they were calculating um, given an assumed amount of flight muscle that these animals might have had, uh, and the amount of muscle, the amount of power that these muscles could generate uh, based on mo modern birds. Uh, whether or not uh, these animals could generate enough power to fly, basically, um, given given these parameters. So, as you can see, there are quite a few assumptions that go into that. But still, it's prob probably uh, you know, not not bad as a proxy for comparative purposes. And they were pretty conservative in terms of um, the uh, the values that they they used for for those um, for those parameters. So what they found was that there were some non-aviolan dinosaurs uh, that appear to have been capable of powered flight, or at least um, that within these parameters could have plausibly uh, uh, performed powered flight. So most of the um, most of the aviolans were able were capable of power flight under these um, parameters, which is not that surprising now we're, we're still not entirely clear how um, how well kind of early paravians like archaeopteryx or early avialans uh, could fly but uh, it's generally not that controversial to suggest that they could however there were also a number of non-avialan dinosaurs that they found were likely to have been able to fly so one of these was rahunavis uh, which is um, a small dinosaur from the late cretaceous of madagascar it's known from a partial skeleton with it has quite long forelimbs. Now, there, there's actually some controversy about its phylogenetic position. Uh, some some studies actually find it to be an avialan, uh, but this study found it as a dromaeosaurid. So, if that's the case, then it was a flying dromaeosaurid. And another one was Microraptor, and so Microraptor actually made an appearance in our previous news episode. Uh, and I, I actually alluded to this study back then because the study had already come out when when we recorded the previous news episode. So Microraptor, uh, just to, to review, was a small uh, dinosaur from the early Cretaceous of China. And it is known from many, many excellent specimens, some of them preserved with feathers. And it had these very long feathers on its forelimbs and also on its hind limbs as well. And uh, in many aspects of its um, skeletal anatomy, it seems likely to have been capable of some kind of aerial locomotion. And this, uh, this study supports this. Uh, this study suggests that it was one of these dinosaurs that was capable of powered flight. And lastly, they also found that some of the Anchorinithids might have been capable of powered flight as well. Although they did warn that um, you know this should be this result should be treated with caution because uh, anatomically the main the Anchorinithids uh, don't seem to be that flight worthy. I guess they they were small, but um, like the structure of their feathers, for example. Uh, don't look very much like the structure of feathers you'd find in a, a flying animal. Um, and in, just in terms of the skeleton, like the, the length of their forelimbs relative to the body and like uh, the fact that they, they don't have a very well-developed uh, breastbone or sternum. Um, yeah, the, these features suggest that you know, if, if they were flying at all, they probably weren't, weren't flying very well. So, um, you know, maybe. But um, I guess kind of the takeaway from, from the study is that they found is most likely that all of these examples of possible powered flight originated 
not from a common ancestor that was also capable of powered flight, but independently within Paravians. And that is quite interesting. That is incredible. I remember when that was speculated about back in like 2007, mm -hmm. or like, you know, maybe, maybe some of the um, Dromaeosaurids might have been uh, flight capable, some right. of the smaller ones. So to kind of see this uh, brought back with mm -hmm. some better evidence is really interesting. Right, right. Um, I'm also kind of cracking up at this uh, selection of dinosaurs here under the fail all flight Oh, yeah. <laughs> <So> Tyrannosaurus, <laughs> definitely weren't flies. Just had to right, fly. right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> we don't know about. <laughs> yep, I'm glad we figured out T Rex could not fly. <laughs> Wouldn't have known that otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but no, that is really incredible. Um, for me, it, it's still kind of a shock mm -hmm. because, like, Growing up, you know, I, I knew as much about dinosaurs as I could get mm -hmm. from all the literature that I read. And, uh, you know, thinking that an animal like Microraptor, you know, might have been able to fly in the same vein as modern birds. Mm -hmm. um, it's still sort of a new idea to me that I'm trying to get used to. Right, right. I guess the same way of like looking at a, a wild turkey or, mm. or a owl yeah. and you know that this thing couldn't fly look at it it's so <laughs> ungainly or heavy or extravagant and, right. and yet they fly right so it, it's so it's definitely something i'm getting used to right right yeah yeah it, it's certainly true that um these early paravians they they still would have lacked a lot of the flight specializations we see in modern birds even in in birds we don't think you know fly that well uh, so it is not clear you know, uh, how long they could stay in the air or, you know, how, how far they could fly once they got in there. But it does seem plausible that many of them could fly to some extent. And in, in those times, like, even if you could fly just a little, that could have well been a very um, strong advantage in escaping from predators, for example. Oh, certainly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, this is quite interesting because, um, as some of you might know, uh, it has been speculated that uh, flight might have been an ancestral condition in Paravians, and that was lost in a lot of the, the flightless forms. So, so you know, something like Velociraptor uh, didn't have wings that were large enough for it to fly. But um, it has been speculated that they could have descended from a flying ancestor. Uh, and, you know, it, it hasn't been strongly supported by recent studies. And this study does not support it because this study suggests that the flight evolved independently several times within this group. But, uh, you know, it's uh, it's always been kind of this interesting idea that's out there. And let's see, what else? Yes, so um, I guess something they suggest is that, I guess, early Paravians, even though they might not have been ancestrally flight capable, they kind of already had a lot of the features that i guess you could say quote unquote pre-adapted them towards flight so again they were small-bodied animals with relatively long arms and these wings on their forelimbs so it's like you only have to tweak a few things for an animal like that to become a flight capable animal uh, and that apparently seems to have been what happened here several times all right so they'd be like uh, exaptations right exactly yeah that's the technical term for that yeah, so, uh, yes, I, I have the, the chart here showing um, which dinosaurs pass which parameters uh, that, they, that they use. So, yeah, as you can see, uh, something like Tyrannosaurus uh, would, would not have either the sufficient wing loading or a specific lift to uh, be powered fires, which is not a surprise. Yeah, and there, there are a few taxa that uh, had large enough wings, but don't seem to have been able to generate enough specific lift. And then other, the remaining taxa are more plausible flyers. Uh, so they, they might fail some of these, um, some of these, uh, proxies under some parameters. Uh, but you know, it's possible that those, uh, 
the the assumptions going to the tra- parameters are incorrect. Like if you're too conservative with the how much muscle mass they had, you, you might calculate and say that they might not have been able to fly. But if you give them slightly bigger muscles, they would have been able to. And of course, when we're dealing with extinct species, it's not always clear uh, which of those uh, parameters, which of those assumptions is correct. Uh, so, yeah, that pretty much shows what they what they found there. So the other study that I um, that is related also came out that also came out last month uh, was done by some of the same authors that did that previous paper. So this one, uh, the lead author is Alex Desici, et al. Um, this paper was uh, part of a huge uh, volume of papers. So there was a special volume published by the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, on Peneraptoran dinosaurs, and Peneraptoran dinosaurs uh, are a group that includes Paravians and also the Oviraptorosaurs, which are another group of kind of feathered and winged dinosaurs, but almost certainly the Oviraptorosaurs uh, could not fly as far as we know. Uh, in fact, they, they were included in that study I just talked about, and none of them uh, passed those proxies for flight potential. So they were winged but not non-flying dinosaurs. Um, so this part, this other study uh, that was published in this volume uh, also looked at flight potential, but they, they kind of use uh, some different approaches. And so they, they focused in on uh, just a few of these early Paravian taxa that have been plausibly suggested to have been flight capable. So they looked at the Anchiornithids, they looked at Microraptor, and they looked at Archaeopteryx, which is probably an early AVL in the low. There's some, some uncertainty about that. Something else that they did is they didn't only look at one specimen for each of these groups. Uh, they looked at specimens of different body sizes to see if kind of different body body sizes, uh, you know, throughout growth, for example, might have been able to change the flight potential in these dinosaurs. Uh, and they did a lot of different calculations. They they did some some different ones from the ones in the previous study. So they, for example, they they also looked at um, not only whether or not they could do powered flight, but also their performance during gliding. So um, they input values of you know how large your wings were, things like that. A lot of these are preserved with wing feathers, but uh, even the the ones that aren't, they estimated from close relatives with known wing feathers. Uh, and calculated how fast they might have been able to glide through the air and how well they would have been, been able to turn during gliding, things like that. And so what they found with the Anchiornithids is that they were less likely to have been capable of powered flight, which is uh, not a surprise because of the anatomical features mentioned previously. And something else is that if they were gliding, they would have glided at higher speeds compared to the other dinosaurs they looked at, but with less agility during gliding. And so that is interesting because you might think, well, going at higher speeds is a good thing, right? But if you're also less good at turning, then that becomes not such a great thing because if you're going at a higher speed or not being able to turn as well, <laughs> well, you, you could probably guess what is likely to happen. <laughs> Especially in a forested environment, which we know that a lot of these dinosaurs were living in. Uh, probably a lot of uh, <laughs> the awareness of the jungle over here. <laughs> the tree? Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, based on this, it seems that it was a lot less likely that Anchiornithids were moving through the air uh, much, if at all. And something else that they found, oh, I, I guess, by the way, I should explain the, the, the chart. So the chart here is um, basically uh, estimated gliding speed. And they did warn not to take these the actual values, the actual numbers themselves, too literally, because um, because they, they rely on a lot of assumptions based on living birds. But nonetheless, they're useful for a comparative measure that uh, Anchiornis would have had higher glide speeds than Microraptor. And so, yeah, you can see that the, the values for the different specimens of Anchiornis are consistently higher. Uh, and I, I think the, um, the different colored bars represent uh, different uh, body mass estimates. So obviously there's always a bit of uncertainty when trying to estimate um, 
the body mass of extinct animals. So they tried different numbers there and see what happened. Um, something else that they found with Anchiornithids is that there doesn't seem to be any obvious trend related to body size um, when it comes to flight performance. Uh, and so they also interpret that as suggesting that they probably weren't really doing much flying, if at all. Uh, because if something is specialized for flight, you might expect, you know, they might get better at flying as they got bigger and older, or, you know, some some kind of trend uh, might be there. But uh, they there's no obvious trend with the Anchiornithids. So um, that might suggest that they they weren't really doing any flying, if at all, or much flying, if at all. Um, with Microraptor, what they found is that it, it probably could uh, do powered flight, so agreeing with the previous study. Um, and also that it seems to have had decreasing flight potential with increasing body size, um, which doesn't necessarily mean that the bigger specimens were bad at flying, but it probably would have been, it might suggest that they it would have taken them more effort, for example, um, to, to get off the ground, or it might have taken them more, more speed if they wanted to, to take off. So either either jumping speed or running speed, because that, that's um, mo pretty much all powered flying animals take off by, by jumping into the air. Um, and we, we actually do see this in some modern birds, especially a lot of the... Um, the galliforms, chicken-like birds. Uh, some uh, in the adults, uh, it, it takes a lot more effort for a lot of the adult galliforms to take off the ground compared to if they were a little smaller and younger. Um, but they, they do manage to get around this by having you know much bigger muscles than the adults. So uh, it does, it's not not really a big um, doesn't really hamper them that much compared to the juveniles. So it's possible that something like this was happening in Microraptor as well. And um, in Archaeopteryx, yeah, in Archaeopteryx, it's actually even more similar to some of those um, those galliforms, because in, in those galliforms, what happens, obviously, the very little chicks don't, don't fly that well, if at all, but uh, they get a little bigger and they start to be able to fly quite well, but then they get to their maximum adult size and they, they start having more, more trouble, or at least require more effort to take off. And in, in Archaeopteryx, what they found is that at medium body sizes, it, it seems to have had the highest flight potential. That's such an interesting situation. Mm -hmm. I guess, would, would there be a higher survival advantage to, I guess, being able to fly a little bit better when you're in between really young and really old? Yeah, that, that's a good question, whether or not there's, a, there's an advantage to that. Um, so I think one of the most famous examples of that is in the megapodes, which are a group of group of galliforms, um, and the the name means big feet because they they have large feet which they use to um, dig nests. And they they're very interesting uh, nesting behaviors. They bury their eggs uh, sometimes under leaf litter or uh, underground, and allow either um, uh, volcanic activity or the heat of the earth or uh, the decomposition of leaf litter to incubate the eggs so they don't they don't sit on their nests um and the the juveniles of megapodes when they hatch out they're they're very uh, what we call precocial so they're very self-sufficient uh, in fact they are capable of flying like not very long after they just hatch and so uh, they actually show this kind of um pattern where the the immature individuals like after they've grown a little bit somewhat uh, seem to be better flyers than the adults, and they are able to disperse quite far, and sometimes even flying to islands offshore, um, whereas the adults are kind of, you know, content just mostly walking on the ground and only flying when they have to. Um, it, it's oh, a wow. good question uh, whether whether there's a specific advantage to that. Uh, maybe, maybe it helps for the juveniles to disperse further. It's hard to say. I'm not sure anyone has really studied that. Hmm. I guess something interesting is that we do know Archaeopteryx lived on an island archipelago, be um, you know, environment. So right, right. May, maybe the juveniles were doing something like like that, where they were flying to other islands, but the the adults kind of stay put where they are. That like was, the reconstructions of Archaeopteryx in a, in a, a big forest aren't necessarily accurate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, those islands appear to have been very dry, so the, most of the vegetation would have been quite, you know, low shrubs and things like that, probably not trees, mostly. So they're probably more akin to uh, shorebirds, wouldn't they? Yeah, in, in some ways, yeah, yeah. 
uh, probably foraging for food on the beach or something like that. Could be, could be. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I suppose, I guess something else uh, that just came to mind is that um, pretty much, I think nearly all of the archaeopteryx specimens we have um, are individuals that are still, that were still growing at the time that they died. Um, so that, that could provide some support for that because the, the fossils of Archaeopteryx, um, that have been found were preserved in lagoons. So they were probably, you know, flying over the lagoons or something when, when they died. Um, and if that's the case, the fact that they are all, you know, still growing individuals might support this kind of hypothesis where the immature individuals are better flyers and being more adventurous. Um, that, that would be interesting okay. to, to look into. Yeah. That, um, that reminds me, going back to Microraptor yeah. for a little bit, um, I noticed here, you know, decreasing flight potential with mm -hmm. increased body size. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then on the previous study right. that, uh, that, um, flight capacity, mm -hmm. I guess, gradients, you know, you have one Microraptor that passes all mm -hmm. the, like, characters and then some of the other Microraptors right. are lesser in that. Right. Are, and, and I'm sure you could clarify this for me. Each of the Microraptor specimens, are they, is it uh, different ages of one species or are they supposed to be different species? Oh, that, that is tricky. I, the current, uh, the current consensus seems to be that it's, they're likely all one, one species, but, uh, there, there have been several species that have been suggested and it, it's certainly not out of the question that they could represent several different species. Uh, there are some interesting anatomical uh, differences between some of the specimens, but the, the problem is that there, there's no kind of consistent anatomical difference uh, among the specimens. Like, you, like some of the specimens have this feature, but not this other feature, and then this other one uh, might have the other feature, but not the first feature, and, and so on. And you don't okay. really see any kind of consistent pattern um, in in the specimens that we have so it's hard to say and well what they did with uh, this study um the for the first study is that they they tried different uh, mass estimates with with microraptor and so under under different mass estimates microraptor may or may not pass all of the proxies that they they said um okay yeah um, so we we do have specimens that clearly show a gradient of body sizes, but uh, I, I it's not entirely clear if they all represent one species or not. All right, uh, I was asking because I was curious if if there was a possibility that there might be different flight capabilities among different species within Microraptor, mm -hmm. if, if that was the case. Right, right. Yeah, it, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah, um, it's a good question. Yeah, we just have to figure out the taxonomy first, which is uh, not straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> right. First things first. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I think that's all I had to say about these couple of, you know, quite interesting studies. Do you have anything yeah, else? Yeah, really fascinating. That's like some windows into the evolution of flight, really. Mm -hmm. I guess I can, if you like, I'll, I'll go ahead and jump into mine. All right, sounds good. Right. Um, so this is a, another paleontological study. Um, so this animal here, Lystrosaurus, um, was a dicynodont, so it's a uh, one of the lineages belonging to the stem mammals. So if you remember Albert's explanation of stem versus crown groups, mm -hmm. so this is on the lineage leading to uh, the living mammals. Uh, now this animal lived from the late Permian period to the early Triassic period, so it actually inhabited both the end of the Paleozoic and the beginning of the Mesozoic era. So that makes it a, a pretty special animal. Mm -hmm. um, it was one of the few survivors of a really dramatic mass extinction event, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, in this particular study, this is by two authors, uh, Megan Whitney and Christian Sidor, and again, apologies if I mispronounce those, uh, they gave some interesting details about the metabolism of this animal. So a little bit of backstory here. Uh, for vertebrate animals with teeth, uh, there's the substance dentine, which lays uh, beneath the enamel, uh, and it's laid down over time with the growth of the animal. Now, a dentine in particular um, is interesting because the growth can be affected by changes in the animal's growth due to metabolic stressors. So uh, in summary, uh, when an animal is receiving very little nutrients, 
or perhaps too many nutrients in its body, it can actually bring great stress to the animal's met 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 metabolism. Uh, you can make cross sections into the teeth and you can examine the growth rings of the dentine and you can find out what sorts of stressors an animal might have faced in its life uh, down to the day. And uh, that's what the authors did for Lystrosaurus. Now, uh, this animal has quite a wide, uh, widespread distribution. Mm -hmm. There's been fossils that have been found from Antarctica all the way to Russia and in between. And so the authors decided to pick a, a small but fair sample size of two Lystrosaurus populations. So you have a South African group and an Antarctic group. And of course, keep in mind, uh, I mentioned all these different continents, but uh, during this time, uh, all the continents would have been together as a supercontinent called Pangaea. This is when that famous supercontinent was in its heyday. Uh, so they made cross sections into the tusks of these animals, which uh, in this case, they kind of hung down from the cranium, almost like saber teeth. Uh, and you know, th these are the best indicators to use because there had been previous research that found that for Lystrosaurus, the tusks do not stop growing throughout the life of the animal. You know, And what's interesting is this is comparable to the incisors of rodents and the tusks of elephants. Mm. So uh, as a general rule, um, if the dentine lines in their cross-section are thin and uniform in a row, well, then the animal is growing normally. Uh, but if there are places where they are thicker and a little bit more sporadic in distribution, well, then that tells you that the animal was facing stress on its metabolic processes at certain points of its life. Now, uh, on the next slide here, mm -hmm. uh, what the authors found was that the tusks of the Antarctic Lystrosaurus, um, they experienced shortened periods of dentine growth that repeated themselves on an almost seasonal basis, whereas the South African Lystrosaurus had more general continuous growth with very little stressors at random intervals. So that's what this um, these graphs here show. Uh, the animals in blue are the Antarctic Lystrosaurus and the animals in orange are the South African Lystrosaurus. And you can see how in the Antarctic specimens, it is sort of like a seasonal basis, whereas the South African ones, they're sporadic among different individuals. Now, uh, Lystrosaurus had a uh, um, interesting body plan, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, it's a very generalized animal. So uh, the, the populations in Antarctica and South Africa are relatively similar as far as anatomical features, but they would have been relatively separate from each other. Uh, among rodents that hibernate, their incisors, when you do cross sections, they show you know, this very same pattern of seasonal stress that is seen on the Antarctic Lystrosaurus specimens. And so this suggested to the authors that at least for these particular populations, maybe Lystrosaurus could enter a state of torpor. That is where the body experiences a temporary period of physiological inactivity. Basically the mental and physical processes shut down, not, not fully because you know, then the animal would die, but just enough so where they can you know, get the rest that they need and they can kind of save energy stores. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like hibernation, which I think is included in that definition too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, uh, even in a world like the early Triassic, you know, you might think that, you know, it's all human and tropical, but uh, actually, you know, there was still dramatic seasonal change, at least at the poles. And Antarctica in particular, being in its location, you know, it was a very high altitude environment back in the day. And it got particularly cool during certain parts mm -hmm. of the year. Now, not like glacier cool, but still fairly cool compared to the more equatorial regions. And so uh, animals in that area almost certainly had to have adapted themselves to those types of conditions. And Lystrosaurus would not have been an exception by any means. Mm. Uh, so perhaps these animals underwent torpor during the cooler seasons so that you know, they, could, they, they couldn't lose excess energy and they could save their strength for when the, the climate got warmer right. and they could you know, look for food and, and browse. Now, what's particularly interesting about this find is considering the similarities between the dentine growth patterns on rodents and elephants with Lystrosaurus, this has been considered evidence that Lystrosaurus itself may have actually been an endotherm, mm -hmm. or what is known as 
heterothermic endotherm. That is to say, it would have been, you know, quote unquote, warm blooded, uh, but it could switch between generating an internal body temperature and getting energy from its environment when it needed. Now, this does make sense in one respect. Uh, most of the living mammals are endotherms. Uh, and given that Lystrosaurus was a dicynodont on the lineage leading to the mammals, well, it might make sense that maybe endothermy would have originated that far down the phylogenetic tree. Um, now, you know, this has been a major controversy in paleontology. Yeah. You know, when does endothermy evolve among the synapsids? And uh, you could argue that this study provides an important piece of evidence to that puzzle, but it's not the be all and end all. Um, cause especially considering that um, endothermy and uh, uh, exothermy, ectothermy are more of a spectrum than a, you know, this animal is strictly warm blooded, this animal is strictly cold blooded. Right. I mean, even though terms are problematic, you know, a warm blooded animal doesn't literally have, you know, warmer blood than its contemporaries. It, mm. It's just a, a, a colloquial term that's never really gone away. Right. Um, to the best ability of some people. <laughs> um, that's why you, nowadays you, t you tend to hear endothermy and exothermy, uh, ectothermy more, right. but those are supposed to be synonymous terms with each other. Uh, endothermy with warm-blooded and ectothermy with cold-blooded, but I digress. Uh, incidentally, the study also lends some interesting support for the idea that the Antarctic region of Pangaea was a refugium for organisms. So that is to say... Uh, during and following the end of the Permian, you know, it was an area where animals and plants and other organisms were able to kind of hang on and begin repopulating the earth following this great mass extinction event, which on the next slide, I'll give some details for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, for those who might not be familiar with this, um, the end Permian mass extinction event, nicknamed the Great Dying, especially in, in popular literature, um, was the largest and most disastrous extinction event known in the history of the Earth. Uh, around 252 million years ago, so this is towards the end of the Permian period, uh, there would have been a substantial series of volcanic eruptions in the Deccan Traps. So this is an area in India. And these lasted perhaps a million years by some estimates. So a very long time of just continuous volcanic eruptions where you know enormous blankets of lava were being poured all over the landscape and you, know, you had this huge release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere on the level of gigatons so that is uh, billions of tons so if you want to do the math uh, it's been estimated that around 170,000 gigatons of co2 mm. were released into the atmosphere you know, that is that is unheard of in the modern world right. to say the least um, not fun at all um, so as you can guess this resulting greenhouse effect caused such a deadly warming of the earth's climate that the land dried and the oceans became acidic and on the order of 80 to 96 percent of all living things on the planet went extinct and that includes many of the synapsids related to lystrosaurus now given its worldwide abundance uh, on the earth following the great dying you know, it has been a bit of an open question as to how this particular animal managed to survive so well compared right. to all of the contemporaries. It's almost miraculous. Well, if you look at the study, you know, it might provide a key answer. You know, if Lystrosaurus was able to undergo torpor, then surely it could have withstood some of the harsher periods of the increasingly warming global climate all the way to its uh, conclusion. You know, and there is additional evidence that had been found previously that shows that Lystrosaurus was actually a burrowing animal. Mm. You know, which, that would have provided extra security during those harsh times. And uh, as I mentioned with the anatomy, you know, it was very generalized. You know, it, it, was, it was an herbivore, but it was not very specialized in any one way to its anatomy. You know, it, it wasn't hyper-specialized as other organisms tend to be. And uh, as a rule... Generalized animals with such flexible lifestyles tend to be the ones that survive mass extinction events, right. go on to repopulate the earth. Uh, hence the reason that perhaps Lystrosaurus was able to survive and prosper. So yeah, all in all, you know, I thought this was a very fascinating study. Um, I certainly would 
love to see more and similar work done on the other stem mammals uh, mm -hmm. of this type. You know, maybe this can help us crack that infamous code about where endothermy evolved. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Albert, was there anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, not too much. I do think it's a very fascinating study. And yeah, it does uh, gel pretty well with, you know, uh, speculation about how this thesaurus might have been able to survive. I, I think it's very interesting how they found uh, there were differences between the different populations. Because, um, you know, that, that does make sense and uh, shows how within kind of this, this genus uh, there were different uh, adaptations in different uh, regions and uh, it also it also kind of sheds light on how this animals survived in polar regions because that, that's always a somewhat interesting topic when looking at what the polar regions would have been like in the deep past uh, in the distant yeah. past yeah yeah especially populated by animals for which their physiology might not have been very familiar to us like well what were they doing it's that that's always interesting oh yeah and it's like yeah you, you hear the word antarctica and your mind is taken to the present day you know mm -hmm. enormous glaciers little to no vegetation penguins and seals mm -hmm. and mites and things but in the triassic you know it was a forested environment full of conifers and tree ferns and reptiles and synapsids and huge contrast to today yeah right right we, we could easily do a whole episode about antarctica's prehistory right absolutely and you know there have been people that have done it very well um, i'm thinking about the episode of pbs's eons oh yeah um, that's right they did do one yeah and so if you want to learn a little bit more about that you know, we recommend checking that out mm -hmm. yeah that's right um yeah and but yeah just despite the despite the somewhat different climate uh, there would have still been you know something like six months of darkness and six months of daylight uh mm -hmm. so that that nonetheless would have caused some interesting um you know selective pressures on the organisms living there which we do see to seem to to see in this case right that kind of reminds me of um the episode of walking with dinosaurs mm, yes that, yes <laughs> that, that, that sort of introduced that to me right you know the idea of you know it may not have been you know snowy winter during the antarctic um mesozoic but you know those periods of darkness um, right incidentally if i remember correctly that episode they, they talk about it taking place in antarctica but I think the fauna is supposed to be from Southern Australia. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> I, I guess it figured because the land masses were connected, they could extrapolate. <laughs> right, right. Well, I, I, I guess that being said, um, that is the end of our show. Mm -hmm. um, as always, our acknowledgments. Um, the fantastic introductory music is made by Henry Thomas, and we thank him very much for that. Uh, of course, the color scheme for Albert's uh, Alvarosaur avatar, I'm try saying that three times fast, <laughs> right. is thanks to uh, Alicia Hutchinson. So we thank her for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, uh, if you want to find updates to new episodes, you can check out our Twitter, at Time and Clades. Um, our YouTube page is Through Time and Clades. Uh, you can search that and find our backlog of, of episodes. Um, and if you have any questions at all about material that we talk about on this show or in general, you can feel free to hit us up at our email, timeandclades at gmail.com. And of course, on our YouTube page, you can find description. In our description, you can find the links to references and notes for this episode mm -hmm. if you want to dive a little bit deeper into the topics that we discussed today. And uh, Albert, I believe for our next episode, we're going to return to your series on modern bird evolution. Is yeah, that correct? I believe so. Yes, yes. We will be looking at the paleonath birds, uh, which include a lot of large flightless forms, uh, a few small flightless forms, and a few small flying forms, uh, and then uh, discuss some of the sometimes surprising patterns of how those, those different ecological morphs came to be. Oh, excited for that for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, other than that, I guess I don't have anything else to add. Do you? Uh, no. Um, as we said previously, our, our format from here on out 
for the rest of the month will be these uh, special topic series. Right. So I'll, we'll do his series and I'll do my series on human evolution. Mm -hmm. And we'll pick back up with the next nature news at the beginning of October. Right. So that will be for the September news stories. Right, right. And we look forward to seeing you all uh, soon yep. for the next episodes. Right. Take care. Absolutely. Have a great day, everyone.